My name's Gordon Kennedy. I'm the minister at Craig Lockhart Church in Edinburgh. Uh, before that, I was a minister down in Port Patrick and Strandrar St Ninians. And before that, I was a minister at New Cumnock in Ayrshire. Uh, and I've met folks from uh, the Presbytery of Wigton and Strandrar and also from uh, the Presbytery of Ayr. And I know what you're all thinking now. You're thinking he doesn't look old enough to have been in ministry to be in all these places. A face like this, it's not the years, it's the mileage. <laughs> Although I'm a minister in Edinburgh just now, uh, you might have guessed I grew up in that other fine city at the opposite end of the way, uh, M8. Uh, a place with the two greatest football teams in Scotland. One of which is Rangers Reserves. <laughs> So, so, a bit closer. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, having started out in Glasgow and now being the minister in a, a church in Edinburgh, I'm actually doing cross cultural mission. <laughs> they try and serve you salt and sauce with your fish and chips. It, it, it needs sorted. There's something wrong with this place. We will get vinegar before I retire. <laughs> I hope everyone's got a handout. Um, I tried to catch everyone. Uh, if you didn't, there were some, some spares at the side. Um, most of what's going to come up here will appear on the handout, so don't panic. I don't think you'll need to be uh, scribbling away all of that. Uh, we're going to talk about growing and understanding our Christian faith. Um, when I was asked to come and do this, I said, oh, so you want me to do the whole conference? <laughs> and they said, no, no. We want you to talk for 20 minutes and then have some questions for folks to discuss with their neighbours uh, and then uh, get some general discussion and feedback and do it all in an hour. So that's quite a challenge. Um, but then just before we started, Hong Suk said to me, you know, we're going to have a song, we're going to start off with some notices, uh, so we'll maybe be a wee bit after eight before we start, he said, don't you worry, you take as long as you want. <laughs> so I hope you've brought a piece, because <laughs> we're going to be here a while. Now, see if this works. Here we go. Life is growth. If it's not growing, it's not living. That's not the motto of Slimming World. <laughs> But basically, it's true. <coughs> if we are not growing in some way, we're not actually alive. That's true of our, our, our own lives. It's true of our lives as Christian disciples. It's true of our lives together as congregations and as denominations. Life is growth. Growth is life. If we're not growing, we're not living. I think lots of people like to see saplings and then a wee bit older trees and a wee bit older trees and, and maybe see them grow. Um, over the last wee while, um, lots of folks have been watching the trees in their garden uh, come into bud um, and they're maybe soon going to spring into a full leaf. You know, spring's still about three or four weeks away in Scotland, but we'll get there <laughs> and we'll see all the leaves come out and the trees are growing. And we like to watch that cycle of growth eh, as the trees after the summer will, will turn those lovely colours and then, then shed their leaves and, and they'll start growing again next year. It would be a tragedy if we planted a sapling and it remained as a sapling forever. We might watch it for a season and if it didn't grow, we might dig in some uh, compost or some manure or something. We might even try moving it to a different spot in the garden. But if after two or three years it was still a sapling, we would be quite disappointed. And we would probably decide it was dead and it was never going to grow. It needs to grow. Growth is is built in to living things. <clears throat> Why is it then that so many Christian people think they don't need to grow? 
Here's a, a good question to have a wee conversation about. Don't we all know brothers and sisters in Christ who for some reason or other have decided that they don't need to grow anymore? Now, that's probably not any of you. You're all here tonight. You've come here because you recognize that, that there's growth. There's an opportunity to uh, learn and experience new things of the gospel and you want to grow. But I'm sure we can think of, of people we know who have got stuck, who have decided that coming to faith in Jesus is the end of the, the, the growth. Coming to faith in Jesus is not the end. It's not the terminus. It's not even hardly a stopping point on the way. It's, it's a, a point on the journey. And we need to keep on growing. Psalmist wrote, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. That's the, the, the kind of key verse for our talk this evening. Seems to me that the psalmist there has caught a hold of the Lord's purpose for each one of us. That we should grow like the palm tree. That we should be uh, as, as renowned as the cedars of Lebanon. That's our future. That's the great desire of God for all of us. That we would grow in him grow in righteousness so by now you may be wanting to know what are we growing into the the picture of a tree might be a good one but i doubt many of us would want to be planted in the garden <laughs> what are we growing into <laughs> take your time you gotta like it <laughs> Look at the Specsavers advert on the side. Yeah, it's as much use as putting it on referees' jumpers. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Rangers must have had half a dozen penalties this year that the refs didn't see. <laughs> My driving instructor, years ago, used to say to me, if you look at the lamppost, you'll hit it. Remember when you did your test, you had to do that reversing round a corner. Has anybody ever done that since they passed their test? <laughs> With the part of Glasgow where I grew up, it seemed as though every corner either had a pillar box or a lamppost. And the temptation was, as you were reversing round, to look at the lamppost. And he used to say to me, if you look at the lamppost, you'll hit it. I think the same is true about growing. If we know what it is we're growing into, we've got a better chance of hitting it. Whereas if we don't have a clue what it is we're trying to grow into, then we'll probably not grow into anything. At least a tree knows it's going to grow into a tree. We need to think a wee bit. We need to try and uh, get some, some clarity on what is it we are growing into? Uh, uh, that went away. There we go. This is quite a long verse, uh, or two verses from Ephesians. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And then it says, Christ is the one from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, each part properly working, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is really simple. We are to grow up into Christ. We are to grow up into the likeness of Christ. There's an old, old book, The Imitation of Christ. Maybe you've read it. That's what we are growing into, is God's visual aids. We are to grow into people to whom God can point and say, see, look, there's what it's like to live in my kingdom. There's what it's like to be my children. And we are to grow up into the likeness of Christ. 
We are also to grow up into love. And there's this verse there in Philippians, it is my prayer, Paul writes, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Having grown up in Glasgow and, and not thinking there was anywhere else in the universe, I don't know if these wee cartoons appeared in, in newspapers anywhere else, but they always appeared in the Daily Record. It was a wee cartoon and it was headed, Love Is. And there was a wee drawing supposed to teach us what love is. If as a culture we need a wee cartoon in the Daily Record to tell us what love is, we really need to grow up in understanding and knowledge and discernment about what it is to be loving. We are to grow up in love. Grow up into people who know God's love for us and who display God's love for others through what we see, what we do, what we think, what we buy, how we live. We use love in a whole lot of ways. I love my dog. I love my wife. You better not get the two mixed up. <laughs> Can you edit that bit out later in case Fiona sees it? <laughs> See when you don't write things down and an idea comes to you, you get halfway through it and you think, Argh. but you know what I mean? Uh, we, we, there are appropriate ways to express love in, in different situations and in different circumstances. And we need knowledge and discernment. We need understanding so that we can love appropriately in all circumstances. I guess what I'm trying to show us here is that there are, there are areas of growth that initially we might think, I know what it is to love. It's pretty obvious what it is to love. I'm not sure it is looking around the world. I'm not sure our culture does know what it is to love one another. But the disciples of Jesus are called to grow up into loving one another so that we can display that to the world and so that we can live like that towards our neighbours, our friends, our family and everyone round about us. We are growing up into the likeness of Jesus. We are growing up into love, to know that we are loved by God and to share that love with others. There was a short version of this talk, growing in understanding our Christian faith. The short version was, if you want to grow in understanding your Christian faith, read the Bible. <laughs> and then I was going to sit down, okay? And if you all said to me, but we've read the Bible, I was going to say, do it again. That's a kind of serious point. I came to faith in Jesus at a midweek Bible study group. So I'm kind of peculiar that way. Because God made himself known to me through reading the Bible, I think everybody should read the Bible and we would grow in understanding God and his love for us in Jesus. And I think that's true. And so if you forget everything else that I've said tonight or I'm going to say, remember that wee bit. There's no substitute for reading your Bible. But this evening, I thought, let's look at an example. Let's look at someone who grew in understanding his Christian faith. Let's look at some uh, incidents in the life of this fellow called Peter, who we kind of all know about because we've heard stories about him since we were in Sunday school. Uh, we read about him in the Bible. Uh, but let's look at some of the, the ways, some of the circumstances that God brought into Peter's life and see how he grew in understanding in his faith. And I'll tell you what, we'll probably find that God uses similar circumstances in our life to grow us in understanding our faith. So the first one, I've, I've put this down on a wee table on the handout, a Peter answered Jesus' call. Isn't that one of the first stories we remember? Jesus walking by the shore and he saw the fishermen and he called to them, come and follow me. And they leave their nets and they go and follow him. Now, at that moment, if we were able to ask Peter, 
what do you understand about the Christian faith? What do you think he would say? What's the Christian faith then? I've never even heard of it. I've no idea what you're talking about. But I know this guy, Jesus. And I am answering his call to follow him. Faith comes before understanding. We seek to understand because we believe already. We do not understand first and then believe. That's our modern scientific way of doing things. That's doubting Thomas. Yeah, once I see it, I'll believe it. Peter and, and uh, Andrew and James and John left their nets and followed Jesus before he had done any miracles, before he had told any parables, before he had died on the cross or risen again. They believed in him, and that was the starting point. They grew in understanding because they already believed. One of the great uh, theologians of the church, a fellow called St. Anselm, wrote about faith seeking understanding. I already believe, but I want to understand more about what I believe. I want to understand a wee bit more. I believe in Jesus. I want to get to know him better so that I will, will know him more. Jesus said, follow me. Here's a wee thought. At the Last Supper, Jesus broke the bread, handed it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. He did not say, understand what I'm doing, and then take it and eat it. Understanding didn't feature. Faith came first. And understanding grows, follows from faith. Second story uh, of Peter. Um, they were in a boat. They were crossing over the sea. There was a storm at the sea. And Jesus was asleep uh, in the boat. And uh, they thought they were going to drown. So they woke Jesus up. And Jesus stood up and spoke to the wind and the waves. Peter grew in understanding his faith. Not only because he saw Jesus speak to the wind and the waves, but because at the very end of the story, Peter and the other disciples asked Jesus a question. Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Faith grows in understanding when we ask questions. That's how we learn things. A question is... There's something I don't know, I would like to know, so I'm going to try and find out. Does everybody here understand everything about the Christian faith? So how are we doing at asking questions? I want to grow in my understanding, so I'm going to ask questions. Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. I think God encourages and invites our questions. I think we together in our congregations should become communities where questions are welcome. I want to grow in understanding my faith and I'm going to ask a question about this. If you take the courage to do that, I'll guarantee there's six people sitting next to you who want to know the answer to that question. Because they've been thinking it as well. In any relationship, there are things we learn. We start off being friends with someone, we don't immediately know everything about them. One of the ways in which we grow in our relationships is asking questions. Asking questions and sharing answers. It's a great way to grow in understanding our faith and we should use it more in our lives and in our congregations. But well, here's another storm at sea. This is the next incident where Peter grows a wee bit in his understanding of, of his Christian faith. There's another storm at sea, but Jesus isn't in the boat this time. Jesus comes walking on the water. 
And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me out to come. And Jesus says, okay, come on. And Peter steps out of the boat and starts walking on the water. Do you think Peter could explain how he was walking on water? But Jesus called him. And he answered Jesus' call. He got out of the boat and he found that it worked. I sometimes say to people, how do you spell faith? And they all look at me like I'm daft. But you actually spell faith R-I-S-K. Okay? Risk. Faith is supposed to be lived walking on the water. Faith is supposed to be lived leaning off the edge of the cliff. Faith is not meant to be lived in your comfortable bungalow a mile and a half back from the cliff edge with a nice garden and a picket fence. We grow in understanding our faith when we hear Jesus call us into action and we step out in response to his call and find that he's there holding us up in the midst of the storm. This kind of understanding is not the same as being able to explain how the water's holding you up. But it's an understanding that if I trust Jesus and answer his call, I'm going to learn that he's faithful. And I may not be able to explain it, but I know that it works. Many people here have sent an email. Has everybody sent an email at some time? Can anybody explain how that email gets from your computer to another computer? <laughs> and when it's taking a long time, I want to get somebody to pull the string a wee bit harder. I have no idea how this non-existent text on a computer screen in front of me somehow gets invisibly to another computer screen, perhaps on the other side of the world. But I don't need to know how it works. I understand that if I type away and I move the mouse thing and I click in that box, this message is going to go. And maybe that's all I need to understand. Sometimes with a title like Growing and Understanding Our Christian Faith, you're looking at it thinking, there's a dozen things I'll never understand. Well, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Let's just understand the things we, we need to understand. If Jesus calls me, I can trust him. And I can get out of the boat in the risky situation in, in my eldership, in my congregation, and find that he is faithful. And find that he, he will hold me up. There's an understanding to grow into. Another few stories then. Um, Peter and, and James and John were taken up a mountain with Jesus and they saw Jesus transfigured and they saw his glory shining. And Peter said, wow, this is great. We want to stay here forever. We're going to build three huts and we're going to stay. And then it was all over. Just for that moment on the mountaintop, Jesus displayed his glory. And I think Peter understood a wee bit more who Jesus is at that moment. I think when we worship together, Jesus pulls back the veil and the light of his glory shines out among us. And I know that you heard about worship earlier in the conference. I don't want to go on about that for a long time. But really, when we gather together for worship, Jesus is there and is gloriously displayed among us. And as we give ourselves to worshipping him, so we grow in understanding something of who he is. <coughs> Next story. It's maybe an odd one. You think Peter grew in his understanding of Jesus when he denied him? Remember that story? Three times before the cock crows and Peter says, ah, no way, no way, I'll lay down my life for you. Sure enough, three times before the cock crowed, 
I don't even know the man. And then just a few days later, after breakfast on the seashore, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Really, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus forgives Peter. I think we grow in understanding our Christian faith when we receive forgiveness. Maybe you're thinking that's, of course that's what we do, we pray for forgiveness all the time. I fear that there are too many Christian people still living unforgiven lives. Too many Christian people who think, Jesus won't forgive my sin. Jesus can't forgive that sin. This thing that I've done is too bad, it's too big for him. And they carry it around. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, near the beginning, uh, the character Christian makes his way through the, the, the narrow gate and he's on the way and he's heading along but he's got a huge burden on his back and he's weighed down with his burden as he travels along and he comes to a place and, and Bunyan describes the track uh, there was a hill sloping down and at the foot of the hill there was a cross and, and as Christian came past the place where the cross was his burden fell off his back and rolled away down the hill and was forgiven at the cross it was taken away from him I've got this picture of all these Christian people coming to the cross and the burden jumps off their back and they chase it down the hill because it's grown comfortable and they want it back. Jesus died and rose again so that we could be forgiven. And we need to grow in understanding that. Jesus did not say, I'm going to die on the cross to forgive some of your sin. I'm going to die on the cross to forgive the easy sins. I'm going to die on the cross to forgive the sins that I choose to forgive. No, all our sin. All the burden of our sin. All the guilt of our sin. Forgiven. And if we could only grow in understanding that we are forgiven, I think we will learn how to forgive others. Because we struggle with that, don't we? Don't we find that hard? But if we knew more powerfully and immediately in our lives that Jesus had forgiven our sin, I think we would grow in that. And we would be more generous and patient and, and self-controlled and, and not likely to be so angry with others in their sin. And wouldn't it be great if the church grew in living forgiven lives? If we understood what, what it meant when Jesus said, I'm going to forgive your sin. After he was forgiven, eh, eh, Jesus said to Peter, go and feed my sheep. And Peter did that. All the way through the book of Acts, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, Peter begins to talk about Jesus. We grow in understanding when we talk to others. We grow in other understanding when we teach others. You might think you know something, but once you start trying to teach someone else it, you learn it all over again. Maybe you've tried to teach uh, some children how to bake a cake. And you've been baking cakes for a million years. And the last time you used a scale, you can't remember. But that child needs to know that about granny, granny's hand. I don't have granny's hand. You know, how, how much do I put in that? And you have to learn over again so you can teach them. You have to understand it so you can teach it. And talking to others about Jesus is one of the best ways to grow in our understanding of our Christian faith. God wants us to do it. Sorry. There's no escape clause here. The only way the church is going to grow is if we tell our neighbours and our friends and our families about Jesus and, and invite them along. There is no other way. 
And once we start doing that, we will find that we do actually know things about Jesus. Our story, our experience of Jesus is all we need to understand to tell someone else about Jesus. But as we tell them, we'll find that our understanding grows, that our confidence in our our story and our grasp of who Jesus is becomes more sure. One of the the great uh, theologians of the, the, the 20th century, a guy called Thomas Merton, wrote many books on on theology Uh, and he wrote one time writing theology is difficult I mean maybe not for great theologians like Norman there but uh, for Thomas Merton writing theology is difficult and then he went on to say it's difficult because when I start to write it I don't know what I want to write it's only as I write that I gain clarity from God about what it is I'm I'm wanting to write about. What an insight. You would think that a, a theology writer would want to have a plan and follow the plan and just basically fill in the in the blanks. And he's saying, no, that doesn't work. I need to start writing so that I can in the process understand. And you might be thinking, I need to understand a whole lot more before I tell people about Jesus. I think Thomas Merton would say, telling people about Jesus is just the same as writing theology. You grow in it as you do it. You understand it as you do it, not before. Peter took the risk of change. Here's a difficult one, okay? change. How many elders slash ministers, delete as appropriate, (laughs) does it take to change a light bulb? (laughs) Change? We've had that light bulb for the last 30 years. (laughs) Jeannie bought it and we're not changing it because it's Jeannie's light bulb. (laughs) Oh dear, you've all heard this (laughs) before. Peter was a Jew. Jews didn't eat with Gentiles until God showed Peter a vision of all clean and unclean animals and he said to Peter, you go and eat it. And Peter said, no, no, imagine disagreeing with God. No, no, I'm going to be pure. And God said, I want to change things. You're going to have to do it a new way. And Peter took the risk of sitting at a table and eating with a Gentile. And there were other Jewish Christians who said he was a backslider. And other Jewish Christians who said he got it wrong. And there were Jews who were not Christians who wanted to stone him. But he took the risk of change. And in that change he understood a wee bit more about God's love not being only for one kind of people but for everyone. Until we take the risk of change, I don't think we're going to grow in understanding our faith. All we're going to have is the understanding of of our faith that we have at present. Growth is change, but change is scary. Isn't it? Well, we know where we are. We know how we do things. We don't really want to change. Let's be honest, the way things have been going in the Church of Scotland the last 30, 40 years, if we keep going the same way without change, we'll not be here in 30, 40 years. Change is not any longer a choice, but a necessity. But we can make it a virtue by understanding that change is a calling of the gospel And as we trust God and and, and respond to his call to change, we're going to get to know Jesus a bit better. And we're going to get to know more about our God and the gospel. One more story of Peter, right? One more story. Crumbs, look at the time. Just as well, he said I could go all night. (laughs) 
It's a problem, isn't it? You've maybe noticed this. Church of Scotland ministers, they love the sound of their own voice. <laughs> Nobody else does, but we all love it. Peter wrote some letters to the church. Okay, Peter wrote some letters to the church. And one of them, he says, our brother Paul has written to you. But in some places, it's hard to understand. And you're all sitting there thinking, you got that right. Isn't it an encouragement that the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes in Holy Scripture that some of the things in Scripture are hard to understand? Because that's what we experience. But that means we've got a choice. It doesn't say some things are impossible to understand. It says they're hard to understand. Remember when the children were at school, that wretched nine times table? <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, but you've got to keep trying. You're not really trying. If you try it, you can get it. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. It actually means when you try it and you understand it, you'll think you're brilliant because it was hard. Einstein's theory of relativity is hard. It really is. But folks study that and understand it and teach it to others. Yes, there are things in our Christian faith that are hard to understand. No point in seeing otherwise. But just because they're hard doesn't mean we can't get there. We've at least got to try we understand that God has called us to use our whole bodies in his service, our hands, our feet, our hearts, our tongues, our eyes, and also this muscle between our ears. God wants us to think about it. Okay. Unlike this talk, which will end soon, <laughs> learning never ends. Neither does understanding. Paul wrote, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Our understanding of our Christian faith will continue to grow until that glorious day when we stand before Jesus and see him face to face. And then we'll understand it all instantly. But until then, growing in our understanding never ends. We have to keep on growing in our understanding. So, on the handout... Um, Hong Sook's way up at the back. Have we got time to, for folks to talk about these questions? Sitting, yep, oh, I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay, good to go. I put down some questions. You can talk about any other questions you want to talk about. <laughs> questions are good. <coughs> what things about my Christian faith do I find it difficult to understand? Where do I identify with the story of Peter's growing understanding of our Christian faith? What will help me grow? in my understanding of my Christian faith. Let's take five, ten minutes, talk to somebody next to you, hopefully somebody you didn't already know or somebody behind you. Um, whatever one of these questions takes your fancy, um, talk about those for the next five or ten minutes. Okay? It's really great to hear um, a whole lot of conversations going on. Um, hopefully they can uh, carry on um, after our session. Um, what I thought uh, we could do is, is just if there's questions or comments or thoughts folks want to share before we finish, just shout out real loud um, so I can hear and I'll try and repeat the question uh, into the mic so everyone else can hear. And maybe we can chat together about some of these things before we finish.
Him, do you want to go first? Can I be very facetious? Yeah. And tell you that the nine times table is one of the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I genuinely wasn't good at much at school, but, but maths was one of them, so I, and we were taught up to 12, so compared with that, nine's easy. But nowadays, children seem to roll their eyes and go all frightened at the nine times table. Thanks. <laughs> any, other, any other thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I it. Yep. Yep. I don't understand why God loves me so much, but I accept it. Okay. That that maybe falls into that category of um, we we step out of the boat, we we hear God say I love you, and we commit ourselves to it, but we're never actually going to be able to explain why God loves me. I often feel like that about my dear wife. I have no idea why she puts up with me. I'm, I'm not meaning to be funny. It's kind of similar. There are relationships we have and people are kind and generous and patient with us. And every now and then we think, wow, why do they put up with me like that? Now, let's multiply that up a bit. God tells me he loves me. I really don't know why. But I have to step out of the boat and, and I find that it works. So it's maybe in that category of understanding. When we get to see Jesus, I'm sure it, it will become clearer. But until then, we're going to just step out of the boat and trust that what he says he means and he does love us. Thanks. That's, that's really helpful. Any other? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Question two about identifying with your Christian faith. But everybody here must have had a calling to say, go and learn at this conference this weekend. And we've all responded. <coughs> thank, thank you to God for, for bringing us here this weekend. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, everyone who's come to the conference. Uh, has, has had a sense of God calling us to come together uh, to learn, to grow in understanding uh, in our Christian faith. Uh, and so thank you to everyone for coming together. Uh, there's a guy, um, Brian McLaren. Anyone ever heard of Brian McLaren? At one time, he was the most popular, uh, most frequently bought Christian author uh, at the late 20th century and into the, the, the 21st century. Um, in one of his books, Brian McLaren wrote about a group of friends who were the community who helped me remember. The community who helped me remember. Do you know what it's like when you've got old friends and you don't see them so often and you get together and at some point during that meeting, somebody's going to say, do you remember when we did such and such? <laughs> oh, that's right. Remember we did that. There's something about community helping us remember. And I think there's something about community helping us understand. The church is a community which helps me understand because we do it together. If, if, if we were to um, hand out volumes of Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics and send you all to your room on your own and ask you to come back tomorrow morning and, and give a learned talk on Barth's Dogmatics, you'd probably throw them all back at me. But I promise you, if we all got into a wee group and we took a paragraph together, we would have a better chance of understanding it than on our own. And, and the value of the church, the value of community is something we overlook in thinking about understanding. Because so much of our model of learning is you do it on your own. You sit with your books, you read it, you make your notes, you think about it. You, you... 
But what happens if we do it together? Like you've done this weekend, there is an added value to community, which we miss out on. So yeah, absolutely right. Thanks for that. Can I, yep. can I, can I change a, a, one of the verbs here? What will help me grow in my understanding of Christian? What does help me in my growing and understanding of Christian faith is studying the Bible in groups. And I cannot understand why there are greater numbers in our congregation who want to be together and share God's word rather than just, I shouldn't say just, rather than public worship yeah. alone. Yeah. And it's, it's quite hard because there seems to be a preconceived idea about what Bible study is like. Yep. Oh, they're going to tell us this, or oh, we're going to have to say something. And it's just so enriching. Yep. And yet, so many in the church mm. aren't interested in yep. being part of it. Yep. Okay. Uh, so the, the question is uh, what will help, what does help? Uh, and what does help is being in small group for a Bible study in particularly, and you were expressing, um, uh, what's the right word, maybe not a frustration, just a, a concern that there are uh, quite a number of Christian people in our congregations who don't want to join in in small groups and who don't want to join in in Bible study, and, and they're missing out. Um, quick straw poll, how many folks here are in a small group? Wow, that's good. That's really great. Um, I love small groups. I said earlier I came to faith in a small group. We met every week on a Wednesday night in a church in Partick. Way, quaint fishing village by the Clyde. <laughs> Partick Thistle, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> we met every week. We read the Bible and, and it came alive as we read it together. So this is about community, but the kind of community where uh, you get the chance to, to, to see, to speak, to engage, to ask your questions. Dare I say, to give your answers. To be part of a conversation which leads to growth and understanding. I think, in my experience, every Christian who belongs to a small group grows Every single Christian who belongs to a small group grows. I am not saying you cannot grow without belonging to a small group. Some people do. But I am saying I don't know of any Christians who fail to grow if they are members of a small group. It seems to generate that kind of, if you like, the nutrients that enable growth to happen. And so being parts of small groups is a great thing. What, what I, I try to say to the folks who are in small groups in our church is, when they say exactly what you've said to me, would you tell others? Would you show them your enthusiasm for being in a small group? Let them see that you can go. Um, we do a, something called the Alpha course. Folks heard about Alpha? which ends up in small groups. And uh, the last couple of times we've done Alpha, we've got somebody from the previous Alpha, not me, not one of the team, but somebody who came along to stand at the front in church and tell others about their experience in Alpha. Both of them have said what they valued was the small groups and the chance to talk together with others. And because they spoke at the front in church, other people came to the next Alpha. And maybe if we want to see small groups grow, we need to take the risk of saying to other folks, our small group's really great. Why don't you come along with me? And you'll see that it's not that scary and you might want to come back. And if you have small groups in your church and you're not in them, well, why don't you try it? I'll guarantee you'll be allowed to go once. And if you don't go back, that'll be okay. But who knows, you might find that you grow a wee bit in your understanding. Thanks for that. Now, were there other folks want to ask or comment or join in? <clears throat> Stunned silence. 
I can do that to congregations every Sunday. The whole lot of them. Stunned silence, fast asleep. <laughs> no, we're done? Okay. Um, I, I, I put on the bottom of the sheet some web-based resources. I was going to put some suggestions for books, but it filled another three pages. <laughs> so I thought, what kind of web resources have I found helpful in growing and understanding my Christian faith? And these are three websites that the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity and the Evangelical Alliance and Tear Fund, who each week put up thoughtful uh, uh, articles on their websites, or you can sign up and get them sent in an email to help you think about our Christian faith. And they will help you grow in understanding your Christian faith. It's not even as much as one side of an E4, but just something to help us think. So uh, the LICC uh, does what it says in the tin. Uh, usually it's politics and current issues, uh, and they will reflect in the light of our Christian faith on those issues. The Evangelical Alliance is a, a bit wider and will cover a whole range of issues. Um, Tear Fund, uh, I saw Tear Fund had a stall in the marketplace, uh, uh, making Jesus known where the need is greatest. Um, love Tear Fund. Tear Fund is about caring for people in the, the most dire poverty. And, and so a lot of their reflective material that they publish is helping us think about issues of justice and poverty uh, and, and Christian compassion. And so if you're interested in, in growing and understanding these things, Tear Fund uh, website's a great place to go. Um, so that's the web resources on the bottom. They're the ones that I know. There are lots of other ones. You can find them out there. Thank you.